So hi and hello to everyone. My name is Nezhan Andrich and I want to welcome you on the fourth webinar in organization of Young Ambassadors. Thank you very much for joining us today. As you all know, we started this online lectures with one goal to speak about the effects that this pandemic crisis have on the creative and cultural sector. And in these webinars, we are speaking about the challenges this sector is facing and how it will look like after pandemic. So our speakers are international experts from different fields of creative industries who are sharing their knowledge and expertise. As you know, this webinar will be focused on the future of architecture, about future of public spaces, role of architecture in pandemic and how it will prevent the next one. Before we start with the lecture, I would like to welcome to our event, Mr. Michael Brook, Attaché for Culture from the US Embassy in Belgrade. Hi, Michael, and thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, Snezhna. Hi, hello. Today hello. we will have representatives of the creative industries from US. So we will, in a couple of minutes, hear about the Adam story. But for the beginning, we would like to hear some of the things that the embassy is doing these days and how you are facing this pandemic crisis. Thank you once again. Well, thank you, Snezhna, and thank you, everyone, at the um, Mladi Ambassadori. Welcome uh, to the Budmovde Svima. And I've forgotten all of my Serbian over the past uh, two months of being holed up in my house, so forgive me. <laughs> but uh, it is, uh, it's kind of a treat to be here. And you know, you ask, how are we going forward and, and doing things? It's a lot like this. We're kind of figuring out as we go. We're, we're learning how to uh, speak more in the virtual space than in the face-to-face -face space. Um, but uh, like you said, I am the uh, cultural attache at the embassy, and I think it might do, uh, do us a, a benefit if I just at least explain what that means, because uh, most people, uh, including myself before I got here, don't really understand what this job entails and, and what it is that we do uh, at the embassy through the, the cultural section. Um, so the, technically through my office uh, at the embassy, we facilitate education and cultural exchange programs. Uh, which educational exchanges like the uh, Fulbright, uh, the Fulbright Scholarship Program, the Humphrey Program, professional exchanges like the International Visitor Leadership Program that sends professionals to the U.S. for a short program, and our speaker program, which brings U.S. experts to Serbia for um, short programs to speak on a variety of issues. And it was actually that program that brought Adam Frampton over uh, back in 2018 about three weeks after I got here, and I was still figuring out where the heck I was, so I wasn't able to make it to the program, but I heard it was fantastic. And the fact that we're having uh, this follow-on uh, tells me that, that was, that's probably true. Um, but that's technically what we do. We, we create these programs that send Americans uh, um, to bring Americans to Serbia and send Serbians to the US. But what's the idea behind it? The idea behind it is that you know, I personally, and we within my office and within the embassy believe that uh, conversations are important. And that the more conversations we have, the more we understand one another. And the more we understand one another, the more we see what brings us together as people. Uh, and so my office is, is mostly interested in bringing people together with people so that we can have those conversations. And as far as I'm concerned, there is nothing better than culture to facilitate those conversations. Uh, culture being, you know, music, film, theater, dance, also visual arts, and also architecture, which I'm not going to pretend for a second to be an expert on, especially in a room like this filled with real experts. Um, but I do know that that architecture, like many other aspects of culture, speaks to a people and speaks to who they are and what they have, uh, speaks to their history to who, what they've done, where they're going, um, where the hopes are, the aspirations are. These are the things that we can really have conversations about when we're talking uh, about culture. So uh, what's that gonna look like after this pandemic? Um, I'm hoping that it looks a lot like what we have done historically, which is um, create in-person exchanges, send people to the US, bring people to Serbia, uh, support, festivals and uh, create opportunities for Serbians and Americans to come together and have these conversations. Um, 
you mentioned open spaces and, and public space. And uh, it immediately takes me back to my life before working uh, with the State Department and before working at embassies. I used to work in the US in parks and recreation. Uh, and my job was to uh, create youth programs and big community events that brought, you know, that, that used silly ideas like pumpkin races which I'll, ex I'll explain that in a separate conversation. It's too long to explain. But the idea behind it was, again, bringing people together. And uh, our, our motto was that we create community through people, parks, and programs. And I think that at the most fundamental level, that's what we try to do in the embassy with our programs, is we try to use the programs that are available to us to uh, bring people together in whatever space is available whether it's in a theater or in a park or in a Zoom uh, meeting about our architecture to create a sense of community. Because once, once we're together as people, really the, our nationality and our politics become less important and who we are fundamentally as people comes to the forefront. And that's where we can have real conversation and dialogue and hopefully move forward, not just as Americans and Serbians, but as people. So, uh, I'm excited to see exchanges like this and meetings like this and have a big group of young people together on a Wednesday night to hear about uh, hear about how architecture, uh, the role it's going to play going forward. Because yeah, we all know, I hate to get into cliches, but we all know the future is in the hands of the young people. So um, thank you for facilitating this. Thank you, Adam, for being here. Thank you uh, for everyone who organized it, and we are proud to be a part of this and to have played one little small part in bringing you all together so that we could have this conversation a year and a half later. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. This is really the great uh, inspirational talk you had for all of us, and we are really all believing in young people and in their uh, will and their uh, possibilities to make a uh, nicer future for all of us but uh, of course architecture plays a big role in this and thank you for uh, helping us in uh, meeting adam at the first place as you say adam was a speaker for our ukraine conference uh, two years ago so we are really uh, happy to have him here again in the ukraine talks so thank you adam very much for joining us today and uh, as you all know adam is an architect and the principal of only design practice for architecture and urbanism in new york and uh, we are really looking forward to hear his story and uh, what role architect and architecture has in all these times and all pandemics and how they can prevent the next one so adam please the floor is yours Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Now I was <laughs> I couldn't unmute myself. Um, thank you so much for for having me, um, Shajana, and uh, thanks to the young ambassadors for arranging um, this discussion. You know, it was such a pleasure to come and visit Niche um, in I guess late two thousand eighteen, um, and so ni nice to be back, kind of virtually. And I um, really also appreciate the words from Michael. Um, you know, I mean, I think it seems like. Um, that is so important right now, um, kind of dialogue and exchange. And, you know, I think in a way the, the this kind of current crisis has the potential to kind of intensify the forces of, um, you know, sort of nationalism and retrenchment and, you know, each of us going back, you know, to kind of social or nationalistic distancing. Um, and so I think just the, the the, the potential for dialogue is quite um, important right now. Um, I'm just gonna pull up my, so I think what I'll do is I'll just maybe um, share some of the work and um, use it as a kind of opportunity to um, maybe speak a little bit to the kind of current um, situation. And, you know, I, I, um, I'm basically, you know, in Brooklyn, New York right now um, and, um, I'll maybe just give a little bit of background before getting into the work exactly. But as mentioned, um, I'm an architect. Um, I have a practice uh, together 
with my partner and wife, Carolina Chomchuk, who um, we, uh, we actually started here um, seven years ago, almost seven years ago. Um, and we're in, I think, what is sort of, a, I guess, an epicenter um, of the pandemic, but I think, you know, kind of fortunate enough to be healthy and safe at the moment, as I hope all of you are, um, even though I can't see you. Um, and, and we have the kind of privilege to work um, and to kind of continue to work and to re work remotely, um, you know, unlike, I think, the the sort of essential workers um, in our community, like the medical and kind of healthcare professionals and grocery and transit and delivery workers and emergency responders. And so, you know, although I'm on Zoom like eight hours a day and suffer from kind of the collapse of that boundary between work and life um, is challenging. Personally, I think we're comparatively, um, you know, comparatively well um, doing well. But, you know, I think that's a kind of um, that term that we've heard a lot this, this question of kind of essential workers versus non-essential workers. I, do, I think it is worth kind of reiterating um, that, uh, you know, in a way we are non-essential, right? We, society doesn't need architects right now. We need other professionals. We need doctors, um, nurses. And, and um, I don't think that, I think in a way architecture is too slow potentially to, you know, to kind of solve the crisis that we find ourselves in. Um, and it's important that we're, um, maybe that we continue kind of thinking and, and acting, of course, but that we um, not, I don't want to be kind of opportunistic in terms of coming here and saying, like, here's the, um, you know, here's the future vision based on coronavirus. And, you know, I think I see, we see a lot of architects kind of doing that here, you know, for instance, here's shipping containers that can make a kind of hospital. I think this is a little bit um, kind of silly and it's worth um you know in a way um taking the broad view um and understanding that also the kind of crisis is um um of course related to to, to architecture and and cities but maybe primarily one of um kind of political questions um so anyways our our work is um we have a really broad range of work um we are our practice is very much interested in this kind of intersection or sort of communication between architecture and urbanism. Those are, at least in the US, two disciplines that are very separate. Um, and so I wanna actually just talk today maybe about some of our work that, that kind of um, is trying to make this, um, this kind of dialogue and um, focus on projects that are primarily related to kind of housing um, in cities and um, we, you know, despite that, we also do like, we have a pretty broad range of, of projects from very small kind of interiors also to kind of larger scale urban design and um, sort of regional, regional planning and, and speculation. Um, this is actually a book that um, I wrote, um, almost, I guess almost about 10, seven, eight, eight years ago um, called Cities Without Ground. I think I presented it in a little more detail um, back in a year and a half ago. So I won't say too much, but it's a kind of book, a, a set of maps of Hong Kong that was uh, co-authored with um, Jonathan Solomon and Clara Wong. And, and they're, they're actually uh, 32 kind of three-dimensional drawings of, um, of the city, um, a kind of no, a Noli plan, three-dimensional Noli plan showing the interconnected, um, you know, uh, pedestrian corridors, atriums, uh, shopping mall lobbies, uh, public transportation, um, you know, subway platforms and this kind of thing. In, in other words, a kind of um, a way of drawing or mapping a very dense city showing its unique um, and three-dimensional form of kind of public space. And I, I just, I, what I want to say about it in a way is like, um, it's been so interesting, you know, we, we live there, uh, Caroline and I lived in Hong Kong working with the Dutch architect from Kohlhaas uh, for a number of years before we're moving to, back to New York. She actually, Carolina came on a, um, on a Fulbright scholarship so thank you Michael for that um, and uh, we but we've been in touch of course with our colleagues and friends in in Hong Kong I mean it's so interesting that um, of a city of 7.5 million people um, approximate in kind of population to New York City um, that I think there have been something like four or five deaths from coronavirus so um, the discipline right now is um, I would say 
or or will be engaged in this kind of dialogue like oh you know we have to move back to the suburbs nobody wants to live in cities anymore they're dangerous you know vectors of kind of disease um, but I think it's quite telling that here a city which is in fact much more dense than New York um, doesn't suffer uh, the same the, the same kind of issues and problems so what what does that say I, I think it says that um, the, the current the pandemic is really a, a question of kind of politics and and, and leadership um, and uh, you know really the priorities of society as a whole you know do, does do you invest in um, you know, public health infrastructure, um, do you, uh, to, to what extent is there a kind of feeling of um, the collective um, among society and to what extent can people, um, you know, kind of act together um, to kind of solve these questions and, and to what extent do you believe in science, you know, because we're um, in the U.S. under um, a kind of political regime that, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't believe in science. So, um, Anyways, that's Hong Kong. We live in New York now. Um, we've been here for, um, uh, like I said, the past seven years. This is a kind of partially a map of the kind of city. And, um, you know, one thing I think we're practicing and working here, we've been really interested in is kind of a, an understanding of like how to make architecture with the kind of this, this um, knowledge um, of the larger territory of the kind of city. Um, and a project that right now, um, my partner and I both, um, we both, we're both also academics. We teach, um, this semester we're teaching um, at the University of Kentucky, the University of Pennsylvania and Columbia University. Um, and through Columbia where I've been for the, also the past six or seven years, um, I'm uh, leading um, the housing lab and we're uh, basically developing a research project right now for the upcoming Venice Biennale. Um, we're looking at, um, you know, kind of coincidentally, we're looking at um, sort of inventions around the beginning of the 20th century in housing, um, in dense urban housing. Um, this is actually one of the buildings that um, we've been examining called the Cherokee Apartments by relatively obscure architect Henry Atterbury Smith. Um, but it, I guess the, the point is that um, what we're interested in is the kind of degree of invention um, at that period, 1920. Um, relative to kind of housing and elements like kind of outdoor stairs and occupiable roofs and balconies. And what what's interesting is it actually this is a housing project that was designed around another, um, you know, uh, highly communicable respiratory disease, uh, tuberculosis. Um, and of course, coming in the wake of the 1918 pandemic. Um, and so it's an interesting historic parallel um, and one that, you know, might provide insights into kind of how we live together. Um, the theme of the upcoming Venice Biennale, um, you know, relative to kind of housing in cities, which I think is is something I also want to kind of um, sort of double down on or, or say that's important, um, you know, as we, like in a way, I think the current crisis is kind of a, um, an, an order of magnitude less potentially than um, the, the kind of, also the kind of current and, slower moving crisis of climate change and um, you know, how we organize ourselves as a society, I think cities remain important and, um, and necessary. Um, so we're also thinking about this, this project um, for the Venice, this research project for the Venice Biennale is actually really around the 1901 um, new, new law, new tenement law, um, which was a very early, um, uh, uh, legislation policy dealing with um, zoning in cities, one of the first really. Um, and um, we're looking at all the kind of inventions around that time also related to like how buildings were assembled and where materials came from. Um, here, this is actually Manhattan on the right and this is the up the Hudson River, um, the Adirondacks and the Catskills where a lot of the materials were kind of sourced in a very local way. So I guess part of the argument um, behind this research project is also thinking about how historic models of in the production of housing um, might be um, important or necessary in the future. Like um, obviously the kind of globalized supply chains of construction materials now are, are totally disrupted um, together with the understanding of um, questions of embodied carbon. Um, we do need to think about, I think, how to, how, how buildings can be assembled and made of materials that are 
lower in carbon, i.e. timber, and um, have a smaller geographic footprint or might be um, assembled more kind of locally. Um, and so through that, through the kind of housing studio, uh, graduate housing studio that I teach and the other work at Columbia, um, we, do, we, we do often kind of look back and, and um, this is actually together with my students, a, a kind of housing project um, from Moscow from 1930, that we, a very inventive um, project by Moise Ginsberg um, that um, was a kind of housing project sort of aimed at um, essentially producing a more um, you know, collectivized society. Um, and it's a model that um, we looked at in the context of kind of contemporary um, sort of sharing economies and in a way under a very different sort of neoliberal um, 20th century political regime um, are kind of strikingly parallel, right? Um, uh, you know, so the idea of this kind of social condenser um, where new units of family and society would kind of emerge is something that you might even hear from, um, you know, kind of we work or we live or any of the kind of, um, you know, uh, current uh, technology um, companies um, that are aimed at sort of disrupting. So I put quotes around it, disrupting kind of models of housing. Um, and so we use this as a kind of starting point. And then I'll kind of shift in a little bit maybe to talking about, um, you know, kind of our, our design and our work. And I, I just, I wanted to kind of show that um, Narcom fiend because I think that um, projects like that have really kind of framed um, a lot of the discussion around um, in, in the design of architecture. Our practice really comes in the wake of the, um, you know, sort of 2008 financial crisis. Um, and, I, and has been, I think, inflected by um, maybe um, discussions about kind of communal form and collectivity. And so this is a project that we designed um, in Brooklyn for um, senior affordable housing. It um, really relies on producing efficiencies sort of within the individual dwelling unit um, in order to kind of frame um, a large uh, sort of collective um, shared space for its sort of residents in the middle of the building. Um, and so you could, I guess you could think of this as a kind of social condenser, perhaps. Um, it's linked uh, from the ground floor by a kind of path um, and sort of secondary circulation that would promote, um, you know, kind of uh, healthy ways of interacting and using the building, i.e. that you can kind of, from the garden in the back, kind of walk up to the second, uh, second third, fourth, and fifth floor um, th through the kind of building. Um, we're also um, really, um, I wanted to share some of this work about, um, this is another research project actually that um, is looking at and thinking about um, New York City. This is a map from um, slightly after the um, 1811 commissioner's plan that laid out the grid um, over Manhattan. And what's interesting about it is that you can actually kind of see that um, um, that the grid wasn't tabula rasa, right? There were pre-existing patterns of settlement, farms, um, creeks, and, and other um, sort of, uh, you know, things that, that existed before the kind of grid. And uh, um, other artists like Gordon Matta Clark have, have kind of pointed out that um, there are these sort of glitches um, in the grid of Manhattan. Um, they're also created, of course, by like surveying accidents and, train easements and other other kind of things but this is a map from his project fake estates that shows um, this kind of slice in property boundaries th through the kind of grid um, and that became something interesting for us as kind of young architects um, you know also because we're really looking for um, looking at the city as I mentioned but also thinking about um, ways in which we can get involved we see in you know with the kind of corporatization of, of architectural practice um, and the um, really since 2008, the kind of increasing financialization of, um, of the production of housing, um, you know, we see that basically it's, um, although we live in a kind of, um, you know, unprecedented housing crisis at the time, it's really, you know, large um, developers uh, commissioning established architects to produce um, really not enough housing. And so we're looking at the kind of margins in a way. And so we mapped out um, this is actually near our neighborhood in Brooklyn. We mapped out all the vacant, irregular lands. Um, these are all kind of slivers of vacant lots, triangular lots, lots that are too small. Um, we kind of organized them and cataloged them in this research 
into triangles, narrow lots. This is actually um, these narrow lots, which are less than 18, uh, 5.5 meters, are um, uh, defined by the zoning code as um, that you can't build on them, basically. So we have all these kind of gaps in the city. And in fact, the blue ones are owned by New York City itself. There, we found about, um, I think, 600 of those. Um, also small lots that are less than 93 square meters. Um, and then the kind of weird ones, basically. So um, in 2017, in the Shenzhen Biennale, we exhibited this kind of project showing 600 of these vacant lots um, on the wall as extrusions with the potential developable area. Um, and then on the pedestals, you can see that there's nine speculative housing prototypes that are really kind of new forms of housing, uh, infill housing that might, um, you know, create certain degrees of kind of architectural invention based on the kind of constrained and irregular characteristics of the land um, underneath them. Um, and really also this, this project is a kind of manifesto about um, how can young architects be involved and, um, and it, it was happening at the time that um, I was also traveling pretty um, frequently to Japan um, and looking um, together with my students from Colombia at you know, the kind of um, degree of invention in architecture there, um, particularly in single family housing because of um, smaller and smaller and stranger shaped uh, pieces of property that arose out of um, the, um, the post bubble situation and um, unique uh, conditions of inheritance law um, in Japan and that, that created these kind of small pieces of land. So. We were really happy then um, last year when New York City announced that it was finally going to um, address um, this, uh, these leftover pieces of land. Um, they set up a competition through New York City um, Housing Preservation and Development and the American Institute of Architects. Um, the competition, um, the idea the co behind the competition is, is to develop affordable housing on these lots that are otherwise too small. Um, and um, I think there was an unprecedented interest. There were about 500 something, 440 entries to the competition and um, we're very happy to win. Um, and so right now we're working with the city. Um, this is our design for a 16 foot eight, um, I, I think, uh, what is that? Six meters, five meters, um, five and a half meters wide um, lot that's about 30 meters deep. And um, anyhow, we're working, uh, we, we developed a kind of design based on fitting a um, mix of uh, seven different units on it, um, compressing some of the infrastructure, um, and really within what is kind of very compact and dense housing, um, how to create you know, livable conditions that are, for instance, have higher proportions because the ceilings are double height. Um, or that uh, provide um, what you see here is kind of a wall for built-in storage that helps helps people um, occupy very small um, small living living areas. So we're working with the city now. Um, we're actually going to act as a developer. They'll transfer us the land for a dollar, hopefully. Um, after a very long process, um, I guess it will take. Um, but um, this is a kind of ongoing project now, and actually, it's been both the research project and the um, um, you know, and the uh, big ideas for small lots competition were preceded by project that we've been working on ourselves. Um, also, has taken a very long time, almost five years now. Um, the structure is almost finished, but we're we, we essentially are building a, a also a narrow house, a four meter wide house, three point nine meter wide house on the lot, which starts from the side of the yellow truck to the other wall over here. Um, and this is a single family house. Um, it's organized, really it's not about the kind of shape outside, um, but the organization inside and how do we configure the circulation in the house to avoid um, the kind of typical plan where you have a long corridor and bathrooms in the middle. Here we have on the right, um, our proposal really for um, just simply a kind of staircase moving up where each, each stair landing becomes a kind of room in of itself. Um, and so you can hear that, you can see that here in the section, the split level section. Um, and what's interesting is a consequence, there's really no walls inside. So the ground floor is completely open um, from front to back. And um, it's just simply defined by these kind of zones for eating, uh, living and dining. Um, it's open to the kind of backyard. 
And then as you move up to the upper floors, we just simply have a kind of volume that with pocket doors that creates kind of bathroom and storage space. So, um, and that's here, as you can see, kind of clad in, in plywood. So that's the, you know, kind of state of the, pro well, this is a while ago, I guess last summer, more than a summer ago, um, under construction, hopefully finishing this year, obviously um, halted now because of the, um, the sort of shutdown um, for most construction uh, in New York right now. But um, I think that that's kind of, I know I'm just kind of in a way sort of presenting our work, but I do rather than kind of talking about maybe how, um, you know, the current crisis affects all of this. Um, but, you know, I do think it's worth saying that I guess our position really um, is that, you know, this is, um, you know, in a way maybe all, um, all still continues to be kind of necessary, right? I mean, we're, I, I think that we still need, despite kind of distancing, despite um, the the way in which things are shut down, I think we still need cities. I think we still need um, dense density. I think we still need, um, we still need to kind of find a way to live together. Um, and, you know, I, I think we're, um, uh, that that's all important. So I don't, we're perhaps kind of shifting the mode of our practice this, right? I mean, I think the crisis um, is, of course, revealing the pre-existing precariousness of, um, of our society, uh, here in the U.S. especially, um, but it's also revealing the kind of precariousness maybe of um, our, our model, which is young, young architectural practice. Um, it's hard. We're, we're, you know, at universities, which we rely on, and, and through our kind of research-based design work, we're very much connected to um, those are also under sort of tremendous amounts of pressure. So um, I guess all of that, we're, we're kind of adapting, we're continuing to work we're with our employees remote working, but um, I, I guess I could add that perhaps this, um, the latter two projects that I just showed you, um, we're acting both in the capacity of, of architect and developer. And maybe that's actually something, maybe that is kind of a shift for us that we're not thinking about solely relying on Kind of commissioned work in the future, but um, actively kind of considering how to shift our practice into a more kind of entrepreneurial mode in the future. Um, and I, I would say that maybe that's kind of an exciting prospect or, or kind of outcome or development. So um, I think I have about half an hour and I see it's 1230. So maybe we can open it up to, to questions. Okay, so thank you, Adam, very much. Before we start with the discussion, just to invite all of you who are participating to write your questions for Adam in uh, chat and then Adam will answer to them. So you are all mute uh, in order to avoid the background sounds and to hear the Adam very well. So please write your questions for him. And uh, yeah, Adam, this is really the great presentation and all the uh, work that you have done in the previous year with your studio. And uh, do you maybe when you are now uh, thinking about the, all the continents, all the countries where you live and work. Uh, so do you think that there are going to be new trends in architecture and uh, what is the most of the things that are going to change in the uh, next period when it is to your field related? Yeah, I, I mean, I do think there will be changes. I think it's a little bit, it's, it would be maybe a little bit foolish to kind of, um, you know, project what those changes would be. I mean, I think we're, um, like I kind of alluded to, I think, you know, also that you could ask the question, like, how did we, how did things change after 2008, right? Like, um, we all know that there were kind of tectonic shifts in, in society um, and um, in ways that were, um, you know, I think some good, but mostly kind of bad. <laughs> Um, and and how does that how does that affect um, you know the kind of architectural discipline? I mean, I would say that we're um, maybe also in kind of looking at um, you know very innovative and interesting kind of Belgian practices. There's a tendency towards kind of sobriety, the, the sort of new soberness that um, our practice um, also perhaps take on takes on. Um, as I mentioned, I think there's a lot more talking and thinking about. Um, the kind of questions of collective, the collective form, um, and even this like the idea that um, we're what, what I presented was all was all kind of housing, right? 
So um, we're maybe for a previous generation of, of architects, um, particularly the ones in which we were trained um, under the kind of so-called star architect system, there's what, what young architects want to do is museums and, um, you know, kind of uh, um, uh, civic, you know, civic buildings and um, flashy kind of signature works that are kind of individually expressive, right? Um, we also eventually want to kind of, um, you know, of course, engage in kind of public work. That's something we're, we're actively kind of pursuing. But I think housing is also something else that's kind of we're, we're working on deeply and thinking about and, um, you know, kind of taking on. And housing is not glamorous, right? I mean, housing is the kind of everyday stuff that, that makes up cities. And I think it's important to say that that housing was um, very important as a kind of... Um, territory for invention for modernist architects, but, and even architects in the kind of 1970s, but um, it certainly wasn't when I was in school. And I think the fact that we, um, you know, that basically we've made that a kind of focus or interest um, in our own practice is reflective of, um, you know, simply the, the, the housing crisis, right, since 2008, um, but also the ways in which like young architects can participate. There's no more, at least in the US, there's not competitions or ways in which young architects can kind of compete for work for, for public buildings. It's all based on kind of experience. So anyhow, what I'm saying is I think that, that um, it would have been very difficult to kind of foresee that in 2008, maybe, but that, that's been a kind of shift. And I think in thinking about that, the shadow of the financial crisis might help us think about um, the kind of shadow of um, you know, this, this sort of the, the 2020 crisis, right? Um, you know, and so may, maybe just as a kind of segue to Alexander's question here, um, I, who's saying, uh, if I, I can just read it maybe and then yeah, yeah, talk or, okay, so it becomes a monologue from, <laughs> from me, but um, high density um, of buildings and settlements is mandatory because of the number of people, the number of people in cities is growing now due to COVID-19 pandemic, there are advocates of building cities of lower densities, but there is no space. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I was kind of suggesting that there are people who, um, let's say like, for instance, new urbanists who are now advocating, opportunistically advocating for the kind of return to the suburbs. Um, I, I think this is BS. Like, I think, look, there's, there's the, 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 the idea that, um, is would be kind of blind to the to the sort of climate the climate crisis that we're facing we need to live in high density cities and when you have a city of uh, like 7.5 million people like hong kong um uh and you have you know they've dealt with it so effectively they have four deaths we have you know approaching 100,000 people dead in the united states it's not it's not about density right singapore has also handled um, COVID-19 uh, particularly well, although I think there's a kind of recent or late resurgence. Um, Taiwan has also been a kind of model of, um, uh, you know, like how to, how to, how to deal with, um, I think they also have a number of deaths that you can count on one hand. And they have Taipei, uh, where I worked for, for some time, is of course very dense um, and, and kind of compact city. So I don't, I don't think it's about, um, as much as we, as much as architects like to think it's all about us, I think it's a question of politics. You know, I think it's really a question of, um, you know, the vice president of Taiwan is an epidemiologist. Um, and these countries are led by, um, you know, I think competent political leaders. Um, and, and we, we have, New York City um, has been um, affected um, so, so, in, drastically because um not because it's a dense city but because we didn't have testing because we had um kind of federal leadership who denied that this crisis existed while it was spreading and we have um really um you know kind of extraordinary inequality for the wealthiest society on earth at any time in history right so th these are the conditions that um have created this and we have you know um i'm sorry to kind of rail here but we have, it's hard not to be angry right now, you know, when our president is telling us to drink bleach and, you know, stick UV in ourselves and, you know, people are dying. So, you know, I think like it's, it's not, 
um, it's, it's maybe not about architecture. It's about, um, it's about politics and, and, and social, social priorities. Um, and of course there's things we're going to do, um, as architects to kind of adapt. You know, I would say like, for instance, that the social, um, senior affordable housing project that we showed, one thing that we would design differently now, as opposed to a couple of years ago, is we would probably add balconies because I live in a, in a, a 50 square meter apartment here. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we, we have a small outdoor space and it's kind of, um, it, it's kind of makes life, I would say much more pleasant. So, um, you know, I think that's something, but of course we see that it, it's not, um, that, that idea is not, if you recall the project that I showed you, the Cherokee apartments that was built for the tuberculosis patients in 1920, they had balconies too. And that's like, you know, modern architecture was so inflected by, um, the, the prevalence of kind of respiratory disease, um, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century. So if you look at, you know, Alvar Aalto's, um, you know, sanatorium, or I think these were all things that our discipline, you know, kind of knows, knows how to do, um, and, and kind of will, will do basically, but yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. We all need to adapt. <laughs> Uh, we have another question. Uh, if we have opportunity to change uh, current public spaces, such as big public stairs, spaces by the river, park, amphitheaters, as open cultural spaces, how we can do that? What is the first steps to start changing those spaces to prevent people from being in big groups but still be part of communities and events? Yeah. Um, well, I think that's a great that's a great question. Um, you know, I do. Um, I think we need public spaces, right? We need to we need to get outside. Um, we see here in Brooklyn or around us, like they're really um, there's a lot of people. It's it's kind of terrifying. There's a lot of people in Prospect Park. There's a lot of people in the parks um, when we go out there, um, and unfortunately, a lot of people not wearing masks and being too close to one another. But um, I, we, you know, we need these. We need more of these spaces. I think. I mean, those spaces are there because of disease. I mean, they're. Th those spaces were, um, you know, kind of created in cities because of the spread of um, of different infectious diseases. So, um, you know, I think first off we need more of them. Um, I think we also need to think about differently. I think one one, one kind of beautiful um, sort of outcome of um, the kind of current crisis is just like, you know, the fact that many roads have don't have cars on them or have less cars on them. I mean, those should be public spaces also. Like we don't, it turns out we don't need that, right? So um, I think that, you know, unfortunately I think New York City is a little bit slow in, um, uh, or I would say other cities are kind of leading in the effort to kind of close streets. Um, and I think we should be closing streets and I think those closes, those changes should be permanent, you know, like we should um, get rid of cars in Manhattan. I mean, you know, it's, it's certainly possible. Um, and I think in that sense, those kind of spaces can become, um, you know, kind of parks. And then, then maybe we don't have to be so worried about, are the parks too crowded, right? Because when we have enough and more of those kind of spaces um, combined, with, combined with density, I think we can maybe address those, those kind of questions, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, would you like to share some, uh, it, yeah, it is hard in these times to have some plans, but uh, maybe to share with us some future plans for uh, your job, for your practice, or what is next on your topic list? Um, well, yeah, we have a couple, we have definitely have a couple kind of ongoing um, things happening now and even like some new work, um, you know, despite, despite everything that's happening. So we're working, um, we're obviously building the last project I showed, um, the, um, the narrow house that's, we're just waiting for the construction to kind of be able to resume here on that. Um, and that the structure is almost finished and topped out. Um, we're um, uh, working on another 10 or 12 unit uh, multifamily housing project in New York City that, um, as I mentioned, we're like adding balconies to right now. <laughs> um, and um, that's in the later stages of design um, and something we hope to start construction on maybe maybe even later this year, but probably probably 2021. Um, 
we have um, we're, we're doing we have other scales of work and we're doing some kind of interior um, an interior pro some interior projects right now but we see a lot of the you know projects that retail projects commercial projects for instance are probably um, not gonna happen they're, they're probably canceled I would guess you know nobody wants to build coffee shop now <laughs> um, or even even later so um, you know, I would say that the, the ongoing work is probably more related to the residential and types of projects. Um, and then, yeah, we're working on the Venice, um, the Venice Biennale, that uh, research project that, um, I mean, who knows we, we, whether Venice will happen or not. It's kind of, um, it's been postponed a little bit and hopefully will still go on, but we don't really know yet in what, what kind of form. I think it's supposed to open in, in August right now. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, we were also actually, um, I mean, this is totally different and I didn't really talk about it or explain it, but um, we've been uh, teaching this semester at the University of Kentucky, um, which is uh, quite, um, you know, sort of interesting uh, part of the U.S. that's um, very rural, at least, where we're, the, the site that we're looking at in, um, in eastern Kentucky. Um, and it's actually a, um, I, I didn't show it because it has nothing to do with cities and it's completely another trajectory, but also very exciting. Um, it's a former, it's an area where all the kind of coal mining happens. Um, and we're working together with um, a, uh, um, a sponsor of the graduate studio um, who is, um, wants to um, actually buy one of these um, former coal mines and convert it into kind of a park um, and sort of a, um, cultural institution or museum um, around a sort of uh, piece of art that he also bought um, um, by uh, the Belgian a Belgian artist um, Berlinda van de Brekere, which is a it's a kind of um, 60 foot long wa anthropomorphic wax tree and so basically the idea is to put it in the coal mine and create a kind of um, a sort of institution around this this piece of art so it's like very um, it's it's also a teaching, I guess, but we're working with the um, the team behind it to also kind of hopefully be involved in um, in developing it further. But it doesn't doesn't maybe it doesn't quite fit into the. We have no idea how um, COVID nineteen affects that or how it. I think the story today I wanted to tell is maybe more about um, you know maybe more about um, our work in cities and our work you know in housing, which I think is just basically what I'm saying is. I think that's that's what's really important now, and I think that people have kind of um, you know healthy and safe spaces to live is um, really a, a big part of um, of how we confront um, you know confront the kind of crisis. Um, okay, yeah, definitely, and uh, maybe for the end of this conversation. Uh, just to share some advices uh, to the all the young architects because almost all the participants of this webinar are the young people who are studying architecture or uh, working in the field of architecture but maybe some advices some lessons learned for the young people who are working in the same field of, uh, that you are working also so uh, what should they learn from this situation and how they maybe can uh, work better on the, their career and what to do next. Yeah. Um, should we should we take any questions from them or? <laughs> While we are waiting for the questions, yeah, maybe you can give them some okay, advice. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm, I'd some, I've had a lot of discussions with my students, obviously, the ones that are, you know, both the ones that are graduating and the ones that are not graduating. I mean, I think there's, a, I, I, I want to be optimistic, but I think um, at least in New York, you know, graduating into kind of a recession um, is a little bit bleak. Um, you know, the opportunities that um, they have, um, you know, combined with the kind of debt that they've likely taken on for their education is really um, uh, super challenging, I think, but there are, I would say that, um, I mean, there really are no jobs, like for those who are graduating, but I think what I, what we do see is that there's, um, my students at least have been extremely kind of inventive in um, 
you know, sort of pivoting to, I mean, both resilient in terms of how they've dealt with it, because, right, we have, as soon as the crisis happened, we had the students from China, for instance, you know, had to go back and quarantine in Hong Kong and China, et cetera. So we were doing classes at what is like, you know, kind of three, four or five in the morning. We had to do like six hours of class studio time. And they're sort of in the middle of the night changing their schedule. And um, it was just kind of incredible to, to sort of see somehow. But um, no, that my, my students have been, you know, very proactive, I think, in thinking about how to um, how to represent and kind of communicate their work on, you know, through this kind of bizarre format of online and distance learning. Um, you know, I think we, something in our office and something that we take to kind of our teaching is like um, building physical models all the time of everything we do as a, as a, as a, tool uh, of kind of design research and learning and so all of a sudden that wasn't possible right we can no longer build models we don't have all the tools in the model shop so they what was interesting is that you know i think seeing that they kind of shifted into other um techniques of design that are maybe um more um conducive to the kind of screen so animation um a lot of them built you know, sort of websites for their kind of projects that could be kind of shared, um, you know, um, with the kind of critics that we invited in, um, you know, globally, because that's also now kind of possible. And so I think that that there's, on the one hand, kind of a shift from students thinking about representation, but I think that particularly with kind of like the websites and stuff, there is then also the idea of like, how do, how do we communicate the work to a larger audience, right? Like if we're not gonna have any jobs in architecture in the future, like maybe I need to kind of do something else. And that, that's the kind of beauty of architecture is that it's a generalist discipline. Um, and so, you know, like former students from Columbia Architecture School started Pinterest. So a lot of the students kind of like take their skills and do other, um, do other things like tech or whatever. And I think that idea of being more entrepreneurial, thinking of the kind of um, maybe broader boundaries of the discipline or doing other things is something that I've really admired actually from, from my students, um, you know, in thinking about, I think really more it's like graduating, graduating into a recession or depression and how to, you know, how to do that. So. Okay. Yes. We have another question. So, uh, is there any architectural forum, meetups, webinars, such events? is this one that uh, are now organized online where we can apply and be part of and who to follow, where to look for them online? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't, I don't, I can't answer that specifically for Serbia, but I can say, I think the, obviously you can go anywhere on Zoom. Um, and I think, think a lot of the schools, a lot of the US schools have kind of opened up, um, you know, a lot of their, um, you know, their sort of, um, their classes um, and their reviews. And although that's, it's kind of at the end of the semester, um, you know, right now for us, um, there are like a bunch of kind of like open courses, I think that um, Columbia has kind of put online and, and other discussions that were happening during the semester. Um, you know, for instance, I, I participated in one with um, my colleague um, Emmett Zeifman and uh, Jimenez Lai and Anna Pujaner um, from Barcelona based practice Miao. Um, so, um, you know, that there's that kind of thing going on too, I would, I guess. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, we're part of like maybe more local. Um, I'm just going to share a link for that, some of the open courses at Columbia. Um, there, those of course are not like live events, right? But that's um, nonetheless still kind of interesting to see some of those classes. I've been doing it myself. Um, but um, yeah, I, don't, I mean, we're in New York City. We're part of like different groups, like um, a group called the Design Advocates that has kind of calls and discussions for you know young architects like us, and really just in a very practical way, like thinking about how to um, keep our businesses afloat and survive um, and, you know, deal with very, you know, trade tips on different programs. And this, I would say that's maybe more kind of business 
oriented, but also kind of oriented to think about how we can, you know, collectively approach um, policymakers and, um, you know, offer our, our help and our work with different initiatives and efforts. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm, I, I guess I can't, um, I guess I would say who to follow and where do you look for them online? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, there's a lot of different things going on, of course. Um, yeah, but I don't know. Are there, are there things in Serbia that you can point to actually? Yeah, now maybe we can hear from Michael also the answer to this question about the situation in Serbia. Okay, let's see. <laughs> There we go. I've changed locations. I hope it's not too daunting, uh, too jarring. So um, I can say that, that as far as we at the embassy and programming goes, we don't have anything that is uh, specific to architecture. But what we do have scattered throughout Serbia are American corners. I know we have one in niche. Um, and at our American corners, there are opportunities uh, for people to get together and have discussion groups. Um, there are individuals there who work on creating programming and even though there's a set schedule for activities and programs during each month, you can always go and speak with the coordinators there and express your interest in something and, and see if there's opportunity to create something. Um, but for us, we don't, like I said, we don't necessarily have anything that I could offer to you right now. Um, what we do is try to see where there's a need and we fill that need by bringing people like Adam over for, you know, unfortunately what, what only ends up being five days or a week. Um, so any follow on, we, we kind of leave up to you to be, uh, be creative, be ambitious and, uh, and generate, generate some discussion groups. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, the American Corner is niche, niche has really nice activities and uh, they were promoting this uh, woman leadership on some online uh, activities. So I think that uh, a lot of participants from today's webinar can join them also. Great. But thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. So I think that uh, for now we don't have any other questions. So maybe for, uh, for the end of the webinar, just to say uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adam, for your time and the presentation and uh, for sharing all your work and the thoughts that you have on the current situation and uh, some uh, advices that you give to the young people, young architects. And also thank you very much, Michael, to you and the whole US Embassy for the support and for sharing the, your activities and uh, your thoughts. So I think that we now covered all the topic and that uh, all of us are uh, trying uh, to find where is our place in this crisis and how we can make better from this situation and uh, despite the, all the things we are just all hoping to uh, have possibility to be offline soon and in present or new public spaces but to speak to make a new conversation and to make some joint activities all together so but till then we are going to see each other on in this kind of uh, meeting so thank you very much for participation today and we are really looking forward to some new activities together. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Take, take care and stay well too. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.